Good morning. Good morning. Greeting to one and all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking the time on this beautiful day to be here to worship the Lord and to bring honor to Him. If you are here by television or the internet, this is the First United Methodist Church in Titusville, Pennsylvania, and we're really glad that you're here too. I have a few announcements, and people are ready to stampede out the door uh, to share more. So, hey, listen, if you're a first-time visitor, uh, obviously, uh, we welcome you, but there are gifts available for you as you go out uh, into the narthex on the right-hand side, uh, and so we're glad we want you to have one of those. If you have a prayer co uh, concern this morning, the ushers will collect those prayer cards that are in the pew racks in front of you uh, during the opening hymn, and so if you want to have a concern lifted up, please fill in the cards at this time. I'm holding the red registration folders, not for because I forgot to take it out of my hand, but to remind us all to fill those in and to pass those along. Greatly appreciate your help if you would do that. If you're a member of the church council, please note that there is a regularly scheduled meeting this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, to all of us as fathers, you'll hear more about this this morning, but happy Father's Day. Thanks for being here, and uh, it's wonderful to celebrate that together here. Uh, also... Where are they? I don't see Joe. I'll get to you guys in just a minute. But Joe and Elisa, if you see Joe and Elisa today, they're celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. And so be sure to celebrate with them. Saw them in Sunday school, but I don't see them in here now. Anyway, so I have some more things to share. But here comes Kim. Hey, don't forget me. <laughs> oh, so, so I couldn't see you through the hat. Good morning, everyone. Well, on behalf Olé. of... <laughs> oh, yeah. Hola. Una gracias. <laughs> yes, we want to say Buenos thank días. you and good morning. Um, we are so excited because Relay for Life was this weekend, and on behalf of our team, I wanted to let you know uh, what this church uh, had raised. So our team total was $3,891.37, and only 140 of that was raised at Relay yesterday. So that means it all came from you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you're one... Yeah, right? <laughs> I um, also wanted to share with you the event total, which was uh, $62,149, and that is be, uh, even though um, there was the least attended and the least amount of teams to raise that money, so that was pretty amazing also. Um, but uh, we're wearing this, our fun stuff, because if you can imagine Bill Lufer and Mary Alice Lufer and... Uh, uh, the Wagners and all of them That's doing a little Lisa. dance and all the kids. Um, we got best uh, decorated booth. And the only, oh. thing, the only thing that gives us is bragging rights. Because we, guess what, guess what, guess what? We won it, we won it. Anyway, so we had a ton of fun next year. We're hoping you come out. And uh, our goal was 4000 If you want to help us reach that, just a few bit to go. And you can give until July, the end of July. Anything so. you wanted to add? Yes, I would like to personally thank Kim for everything that she's done because, you know, she had to pay, uh, fill big shoes. I mean, the Lutherans With really, a broken shoe. Yeah. <laughs> the Lutherans do a really great job for Relay and for her to pick it up and do it. And I am so thankful. Our team was amazing. Uh, our decorations were amazing thanks to uh, yes, Bonnie, Bonnie and them. Ron and doing so, the invocation. So yes. thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I'm Michael Muchas gracias. Margie. I won most team spirit. <laughs> I, I know that's a shock, but I really did. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. It is time to get our jungle on and get ready for Bible school. Bible school will be happening in a little over a month. It is a jungle theme. Go ahead, children. The children will be passing out little date savers to some people. <laughs> Only because I only made 20. Mm. And anyway, I'm inviting you to come down after church today and have a cupcake, a cookie, a beverage, and sign up. Whether you would like to be a helper, and we do need lots of helpers to help us run Bible school, or you have children that you would like to sign up, or you would like to take registration papers and pass them out in your neighborhood. Any way you would like to, to help us, we will certainly appreciate that help. It is July 20th through 24th from 6 to 8.30 in the evenings. And it, again, it's a jungle theme. 
We are going to have a great session this year, and I hope that everyone can help us, and we'll see you downstairs after worship. Instead of it being a jungle out there, it's going to be a jungle in here. A jungle in here. All right. Well, let's take a couple of moments then to celebrate that we are God's people because of Jesus Christ. Would you rise and greet each other in his love? I'd like to ask you all to take your seats for just a minute before we get started. This is Father's Day. Hopefully that's not a surprise to any of you. Hopefully you've been thinking about that and planning how you can honor your father today, if at all possible. You know, the first Father's Day was actually celebrated in 1908 that we know of. And it was a service that was held in a Methodist church in West Virginia to honor the memory of 360 men who were killed in a, mine, a coal mine accident. And most of them were fathers, and so they had this service to remember their sacrifice. And this was an, a one-time thing. It was never repeated, but West Virginia likes to take credit for having the first Father's Day service. But um, in 1910, actually, is when the, the nationwide movement got a, a big, bigger push from a woman by the name of Sonora Dodd who decided that she wanted to recognize male parents as we had already as a country been recognizing mothers. She wanted to do it to recognize fathers and especially because um, her dad was a single father who raised six kids after his wife died in childbirth. And so she was really thankful for his example and wanted to, um, to be able to recognize him and all the fathers for all that they do. Uh, so that was in 1910 and it really didn't catch on very well because a lot of men kind of scoffed at it because they thought getting flowers was kind of a sissy thing. So um, they kind of, it kind of went along for a little while, but in World War II, it kind of picked up popularity again when they celebrated it to honor a lot of the troops that were serving overseas at that time. But it really actually didn't become an, an official holiday here in the United States until 1972. Um, Father's Day is the fifth biggest uh, day for Hallmark cards in terms of how many cards are bought for an occasion. And it's also the number one day for collect phone calls. Uh, so, and uh, as things have evolved over the years, we women and children have taken the hint and we mostly skip the flowers and we're giving more manly gifts like ties and um, electronics and gadgets and power tools and things that are, you know. Oh, okay, I'll keep that in mind. I'll keep that in mind. Um, so, so we as a congregation want to take this time to say thank you to all of you fathers who are out there doing the right thing, um, who are filling the, the important God-given role that, that he's um, put you in our families to fulfill and to lovingly lead our families with courage and with power. And, and um, you know, some of you are busy strapping babies into car seats and some of you are checking on toddlers who some all of a sudden get a little too quiet and you don't know what they're up to. 
or um, some of you are fixing the leaky toilet or helping with the dishes or going to work every day to provide for your family. And um, sadly, you don't get the recognition that you often need, but we want to take this time to encourage you. Uh, and during this children's sermon, we're going to be passing out uh, gifts on behalf of the church to thank you all for that. So this Father's Day, we want to tell you this. Um, thank you for all that you're doing to benefit our families. What you do matters. So stay the course, keep up the good work, because we need you. So happy Father's Day, and God bless you all. And would you all raise, um, rise to your feet, and let's call ourselves to worship our almighty Heavenly Father. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid, amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. So it's now it's time to sing those praises. certainly do rejoice at all the wonderful things you have done for us. We ask that you accept this offering of praise that we bring to you this morning, that your presence will be felt in each heart of our hearts as we uh, gather together to hear you, your word and your message that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Set. Okay. I don't want my golden slippers when I reach my heaven's home. I just want to see my Jesus. Sitting there upon his throne I don't want 
No fancy mansions Just a place to lay my head Where I rest In peace eternal When I pay my earthly debt Is my guitar on? Oh, I'm sorry. That might help. There we go. Well, I don't want my golden slippers when I enter heaven's door. I'll be free to sing his praises where the sun shines evermore. Just a plain and simple cottage Down the street from Jesus' door Where I'll visit with my loved ones Who have journeyed on before Well, I don't want my golden slippers just a plain and simple shoe I don't want my golden pathway Just a country road will do Love to see the devil tremble When he sees me on my knees I don't want my golden slippers I'm just long to be free Well, I don't want my golden slippers When I reach my heaven's home I just want to see my Jesus Sitting there upon his throne I don't want no fancy mansions just a place to lay my head Where I'll rest in peace eternal When I play my earthly death I don't want my golden slippers Thanks, Jim, and it's time for the children to come forward. We invite you to come on down. Thanks. everybody I already told you what day today is do you remember what I said Father's Day, Father's Day. Father's Day. right did anybody bring your dad with you to church today well, yeah. Yeah, awesome well I want to I want to look at a few things that I brought in this bag today we're going to talk about what they might have to do with our bats okay uh, well let's see what I have in here how about this what do you think this might sure. have to do with your dad. It's a boy shirt. It's a boy, it's a boy shirt, shirt, but what does dad wear. do? I'm sorry? You can wear it. You can wear it. And your dad's, one of their jobs is to make sure that you have enough clothes to wear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what my mom does. No, dad Quite does. Dad does okay, how about this thing? Ball. Baseball! It's a ball. It's a ball. It plays baseball. Right, dads are good. Daddy. Dads are good at playing games. We're talking about you, Daddy, up there. How 
have this jar of peanut butter? What do you think that has to do with that? He feeds us. He feeds us. He gets money to buy food for us. That's right. He feeds us. Make sure we have plenty to eat. My mom does all the shopping sometimes. How about this thing? He lawns the grass so we can mow the grass. Right, he mows the grass. Hey, why am I mowing? I know some moms that do that too, but I know that's often dads. Dad definitely does that. Um, That's right, Dad. Why do you think I have this with me? He's our, he's our, he's our defender. Us. Right? He protects us. Now, how many of you have dads that have swords that go out and protect you? No, they have, they have other ways that they do that, don't they? Yeah. Um, yeah, but we have toy swords. Yeah? They're just like little plastic. Oh, okay. Plastic hurts. Well, how about this? Duct tape! He fixed duct tape. He fixed duct tape. He can yeah. fix anything with this. I'll buy you duct tape. You to your bed. <laughs> <laughs> how about this? Can he drives you. He drives us yeah. where we need and to go. He takes you Drive wherever you need to go. Right. Wait, that's your keys? How about these? Shoe. He slippers. Slippers to wear. He buys you. He buys us shoes so that our feet don't hit rocks and then our toenail. Yeah, I, I brought these because I want us to remember that our dads worry about us for all of our life. Because every time I go to my house and take my shoes off, my dad said, my dad still tells me, where are your slippers? Um, okay, I have one more thing in the bag. A Bible! What's that have to do with your dad? He makes sure that we are safe in God. Right. Your dad can read to you, and he can read to you stories out of the Bible, and it's important that he helps you learn who God is, because God's our Heavenly Father, and God our Heavenly Father can do all of these kind of things too. And although we can't see God our Heavenly Father, we know that he's with us. And one of the ways we can know he's with us is because of the fathers and the grandfathers and the uncles and the important men that he puts in our lives to take care of us every day. So today we want to thank God for those men. So will you all bow your heads and repeat after me. Dear Father, Dear Father, we thank you. We thank you for all those special men, for all those special men that you put in our lives, that you put in our lives to take care of us. To take care of us. Help them. Help them to be strong. To be strong. And to grow. And to grow. More like you. More like you. Every day. Every day. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, today's our Santa Fe penny offering, and that is what we're going to collect today for kids who don't have parents. Guess what? So we need to be praying for them, too, that God will give them special people in their lives to take care of them. My sisters love duct tape. <laughs> You're really good up to them. They're working on purses and stuff.
thanks kids for your help and for all those of you who have given. Uh, those who are going to junior church can go over to this side. and Miss Lisa is there to guide you. Those who are sitting with your parents, it's time to return there. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to give back a little bit to you. And we ask that um, these gifts and offerings that we give to you today will be multiplied and will be used to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you join with us in singing Majesty, Worship His Majesty.
Amen. And you may be seated. We have a number of cards as usual, and so we want to present these. Bef I want to present them before you, but present them before the Lord as well. Uh, there's a prayer card here that's for either Wendy or Weedy, and I'm sorry because I'm just not sure about one letter, but uh, she needs prayer. Praying for Dan, for Margie Westcott, for uh, the pastors, for our country. Uh, also, Jack, uh, sorry, Dr. Joe Dunn uh, fell in his home on Friday evening and uh, broke a bone in his leg, and so praying for his recovery. For Jane Johnson, who has been re-diagnosed with cancer, please pray for her. That's a very serious situation. For Sandy uh, Burt, recovering uh, from, or is in the process of grieving. For Pat Booth, who has cancer, and uh, Marianne. Uh, Donakowski, who had a stroke, uh, also praying for Chip Drake. There's an unspoken prayer request here, a prayer for the Reed family, for Ed, Jim, Sue, Dan, Sally, all with health pr uh, problems for Dave and Nancy, uh, for Kelsey, who has a throat infection, and also for safe travel for a family, for Dick and Libby Coleman, uh, Donald Peer, for Becca, for Dan Way, and for Randy Daly, for the Teddy Muir family, uh, for Jack uh, Samonski, who has medical needs, for Denise, Priscilla, Anne Marie, Robert, and Thelma, for Alice, Margaret, John, Lynn, Carol, and Mike, for the Wakefield family, who had uh, the death of a mother, Margaret. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear gracious Father, we are grateful to be able to, here in the midst of this time of worship, have a conversation with you. We have gathered here to give you the honor due your name for you alone are worthy. We're here to acknowledge afresh that you're God over all that is, uh, that you have created all things and that you're our maker and we thank you, Lord, that you reign sovereignly over our lives. And Lord, we want to live with your reign in us as well. And so, Lord, today as we turn to your word in the moments ahead, help us to hear what you have to say to us. That we'd have hearts that are receptive, minds that are open uh, to submit to you and to your will, and that you would accomplish in us that which is pleasing to you. And God, we thank you that as difficult, as impossible, as overwhelming uh, the circumstances are that we've mentioned today, we give them to you because you're able. And we pray for healing where needed, for protection, uh, for those who might be traveling, for encouragement, for those who have lost loved ones. Uh, for Mike and Elaine, we pray for your blessing on them, that they would have the resources needed to fulfill the call that you have given them, and that even while they're here from in a long distance, that you would use them in special ways in churches and even in the contact that they have with friends uh, at their mission. We also thank you, Lord, just that you are with us. We have the confidence of that because Jesus Christ came into the world as a love gift. And you've given us your spirit as a promise of all that is to come. And we pray it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. You remember that when uh, we have been looking at the book of Romans, we have titled the whole series, When in Rome, but of course the line different than the culture, don't do as the Romans. Rome was the center of the known world then and really contrary to God, but Paul sent this amazing letter to help clarify what it means to be in Christ and what it means to live out the Christian life. Well, today... Uh, we might call this whole section new owner. Now, think with me, if you would, please. What happens when there is a new 
owner. I know some of this is, is obvious, but, but think about it for just a couple of moments. You know, when the keys are turned over, given over from one to the next, uh, you know, it might be a business, for example, that there's a new owner of a business. Well, who's responsible for the decision making, for the policy? Why, it's the new owner. And it might be different than the policies and the procedures of the person before, and the old owner may think, whoa, but they're no longer the owner because they've turned over the keys and the responsibility for decision making for the new owner. If it's a new home, the new owner can go in and you may have absolutely loved the paint job in or outside of that house, but the new owner can paint it however they want, right? They may not like your colors, but it doesn't matter because they are the new owners. And so that's what it means then to be a, a, a new uh, owner and so, now, what does that have to do with our Christian lives? We're going to see as we read God's Word together today that we've been bought with a price, that we belong to Him, and that we need to turn over the keys, the control of ourselves to God so that He might reign in us as our new owner. And so we're going to look at uh, these 14 verses. We're going to start with uh, what you see on the screen. We'll get to the rest in just a moment. But Paul began this chapter 6 in the following way. He said, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer. You hear the tension here in this verse between some people who thought, hey, I can go on sinning, but Paul said, absolutely not. Now, there's a term that you don't need to remember. You don't need to repeat it. You don't need to take it home, but it is a word that's been used throughout church history to describe the scene of what Paul was responding to here, and that term is antinomianism. And it was a perspective, yeah, I know, it's an awful word, isn't it? But the perspective was that people were saying, hey, we have been given grace from God. We're free to do whatever we want. But that's not what grace is all about. Yes, God gives us free grace. It doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on me. And yes, forgiveness is available because of the work of Jesus Christ for us. But the thought was, the philosophy behind that term was that people were thinking, well, listen, since I can be forgiven and God has given me grace, the more I sin, the more grace I get. That's not the idea. Paul said, no. Absolutely not. That's not what he was teaching about uh, in the book of Romans. Yes, he was teaching about grace, but that grace also gives us the capacity to live a new life, to honor God. And so there is a shift. Uh, most of what we've read about in Romans up to this point through the first five chapters and really on through the first 11 chapters, but here you do see a shift from how uh, the, the earlier chapters were talking about how we stand before God because of Jesus Christ. But also we begin to see Paul's talking about how we live out the Christian life here in these words. And so we need to look more closely at them. Well, there was once a pastor who knew that he was being inconsistent both with his faith and the customs, the traditions of the church that he served, but he liked to drink alcohol. And he couldn't seem to break himself of the habit and so, but he didn't want to be caught because he didn't want this to be a source of conflict in his church. And so he didn't want his people to know. And so what he would do, that he would order alcohol and have it shipped in boxes that said books. Now, this inconsistency in his life worked for a while. But the problem was, one day he got a call from the local postmaster who said, Pastor, you have a problem. Your books are leaking. The story we laugh, but the reality is that sometimes we do leak. That those inconsistencies that we have in our life, people begin to see. And it may be different for you than it is for me or from the person sitting next to you, but all of us struggle with this whole idea of sin in one way or another. Now, we praise God for grace, but we know that we're not always where God wants us to be. 
And this passage begins to show us how we can get there. And so we need to stay tuned and listen to what it has to say to us. But the idea then here is how we live our new life in Christ. God puts life in us in Christ, but how do we live it out on a daily basis? And one of the first things that we're going to observe in this passage is as follows, our identification in Christ. Now, I tried to make an ID card for me, but you notice it's not my picture, but here's the idea. And we're going to see this as we read these words. Let's say that, you know, my ID card says I'm Ron Hippo. I'm the pastor of the First United Methodist Church here, here in Titusville. But if we are living out a relationship with Jesus Christ, our identity should be from him and in him. And so that we're becoming more like him. And so people aren't seeing us, but they're seeing Jesus. And if we're not, then we are, have a disconnect between what God has done for us and what he wants to do in us. And so our identity uh, should be in Christ. Now Paul explains it in these verses that follows like this. He says, or don't you know? that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We therefore were buried with him through baptism in, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The old's gone, the new comes. And he goes on like this. If we have been united with him... Like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And he continues, Now that we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ <clears throat> was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death has no, long, or no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. <clears throat> A few things about baptism. Now, I'm not here to argue for one side of baptism or the other. Uh, if we are going to argue about the mode and the form of baptism, the amount of baptism, that's going to distract us, us from the lesson that is here. But the picture that Paul paints is unquestionably baptism through immersion. And so he's identifying that when we're on the one side of the waters of baptism, we identify with the death of Jesus Christ. We have our identity in his death. And as Jesus died, we die to sin. And that when we are buried under the waters of baptism, it's like we're buried with Christ. But then we don't stay there. Because you see, as Christ was raised from the dead, our identity is with the resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, we can get all hung up on baptism, but the idea is our relationship with Christ, not the kind of baptism that we have. He uses the analogy to help us to see what our life should be like in Jesus Christ. So, he also lets us know then that baptism is a way in which we're outwardly marked. We're marked with what, who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. But the issue is what he also does inwardly by the Spirit in our life to enable us to live like him. So our identification to be united with his death, his burial, and resurrection, I should not only share in the victory that he had, but I should live in that victory myself because of who he is and what he has done for me. Now, the picture on the screen, not the best picture I could find, but nevertheless, it's what I had with the time that I had. And so the word baptism, in, before it was a Christian term, and before Paul used it, in the culture back in the ancient days was like taking a piece of cloth and dipping it into the dye. And when it's taken up out of the dye, it's no longer the same. 
because it's taken on the identity of the dye itself. And so there was a change from before in the way that it was. It's put in the dye and taken out, and it takes on the identity of the dye. We are baptized into Christ Jesus. There should be the identity within our hearts and lives to take on the qualities and the character of Jesus Christ, that there's an inner transformation that works out in our daily living. But also, the, the word was used, and I'm not going to have a picture up here for this, but, but you know it carries the idea of cleansing. And so let's say that the cloth is dirty, filthy. It's a filthy rag, but when it's put in the water with the soap, the idea is to wash it so that it comes out no longer dirty but clean. And so those are images behind this whole idea of baptism that God wants to bring about a real change in us. But it is through the death of and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in us. Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians in his second letter, chapter 5, verse 17, he said it like this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come because we take on the identity of Jesus Christ. And to the Ephesians, he said, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness and so in the Christian life it is to be about a, a transition so <clears throat> what was true of us before Christ is left behind and that we're more and more becoming like Christ in, in our, all that we are and do. Now I told the folks at the early service this is the Father's Day part of the message. But one day there was a mother that had to be away. I don't know if she was working or going to be with friends. But anyway, she put her husband in charge of their baby. And not a much of a moment beyond when she left, the baby started to cry. And the dad was, oh, what am I going to do? Because the baby cried and cried and cried. And the father tried everything that he could think of, but the baby kept on crying. And so finally, after a long, long period of time of this baby crying, he decides, I've got to take him to the doctor's. So off they go to the doctor's office, and the doctor begins to give him the baby an exam, and he's going along, and finally the doctor opened the baby's diaper and said, he needs a change. And the father thought about it, and he says, well, he was surprised by the fact that the doctor said that, and he said, well, on the package for the diapers, it says for up to 15 pounds. <laughs> <coughs> Dads and moms, there are many times that we also are clueless about what God wants for us. That we're carrying stuff we shouldn't be carrying. God wants a change. He wants to make us new. He wants to clean us up. He wants us to be the people that he has called us to be. We need to have our identity in Christ. But also in this passage, we will begin to see here in just a couple of moments that we are to be instruments of Christ, not only to have our identity in him, but we're to be instruments. And see, of course, musical instruments on the screen as an illustration but the word that Paul uses here could also uh, mean tools that are instruments in a worker's hands. It could be weapons of war, so that which is in the hands of soldiers. But the idea is an instrument. Think about it for just a moment. But it goes like this. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin, what? Reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness, for sin shall not be your Master, because you are not under law, but under grace. So we need to recognize that what Paul teaches here is that grace accomplishes far more than what we sometimes think. 
Not only does he save us uh, from the penalty of sin, but he's also saving us from the power of sin over us so that we, in gratitude for who he is and what he's done for us, give God the control as the new owner of us to him. Now, it's been said that a kamikaze pilot who accomplished 50 missions was someone who was involved but not committed. And how about us? You know, we, we may talk the Christian life. You know, we may be involved in a, in a small group. We may attend worship regularly. Uh, we may be involved in the life of the church, but are we God's instrument to accomplish his purpose? And yes, there's sacrifice, but I'm not asking to be a kamikaze. But the idea, you understand, how committed are we to God's mission and what he wants to do in and through us? Well, there was a young African boy who, who met a missionary, and he... he came to faith in Christ. He was a new convert under this missionary. Actually began to work for the missionary, but one day um, he stole something from the missionary. And of course the missionary was a little disappointed, and he confronted the boy about him stealing, and he said, well, why did you do it? And the little boy, or the young boy, said to him, he said, I didn't do it. It was grandfather in my bones. Now think about that, but it was his African way of saying that he's not responsible, it was in his nature. His old life was like that, but he was making an excuse for why he continued to do uh, this particular behavior. But the missionary continued to love on him and to work with him, to disciple him and to teach him. And he would periodically ask, well, how is grandfather in your bones? And the boy would say, well, grandfather isn't dead yet, but he doesn't get around like he used to. He doesn't get around like he used to. So how about for us? We know the old life before Christ is at work still in us. It affects us in how we uh, interact with other people, our behavior, the things that we are and do. But is it becoming more and more a thing of the past? Not getting along well these days because someone else is in control. That we're trusting Jesus Christ, that we're offering who we are to be instruments of him and not offering ourselves to be instruments of sin, but we're saying, listen, you bought me with a price, you died for me, and of gratitude, here I am, Lord, I belong to you. And so when Paul was writing to the Corinthians in chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, he put it like this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you whom you have received from God? Now listen here. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Jesus paid the price with his death for you and for me. What can we do? The only thing we can do is, yes, receive that grace that was freely given, but then offer ourselves to be a temple through which the Holy Spirit dwells and to recognize that the keys belong to him and give him all that we are in gratitude for what he has done for us. It's an easy way to put it, but it's true. God loves us just as we are. But he loves us too much to leave us as we are, so he gives us the help of the Holy Spirit so that we will become more like him. Jerome's coming, but as he's coming up, we want to take a moment to pray. And this morning, as, <clears throat> as we're having this time of prayer, you know where you may struggle with what kind of an attitude you might be hanging on to, 
uh, what kind of besetting sin that may be prominent in your life. Uh, it, it may be just an attitude. It might be an unforgiving spirit. But whatever it is that, that you know is w where you struggle, this is between you and God. But I want to invite us, because the Word of God invites us, to say to the Lord today, thank you for what you've done for me. And in gratitude, I, I want you to be the new owner. I want to leave the past behind, and I want from today on to let you reign in my life so that I'm an instrument of righteousness, so that I can be faithful to what your word teaches. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this amazing lesson. But we want it to be more than just intellectually understanding the truth of what's here. Uh, we want to be like that cloth in the dye, changed to have our identity in Christ. And that we will also be an instrument of Christ, that we will let you reign to be the Lord over all that we are and do. We want to express our gratitude to you in this way, so accept what we offer you today to leave behind and accept our humility before you that you might reign in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Make me broken so I can be healed Cause I'm so callous now I can't feel I want to run to you A heart wide open Make me broken Make me empty So I can be filled Cause I'm still holding Onto my will and I'm completed when you are with me make me empty until you are my one desire till you are my one true love till you are my breath my everything Lord please keep making me make me lonely so I can be yours till I want no one more than you Lord is in the darkness I know you will hold me and make me lonely till you are my one desire, till you are my one true love, till you are my breath, my everything. Lord, please keep me. Me. I hope we'll make that our prayer that the Lord would keep making us. It is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that are ours and at work in us so that we can serve Him. And we ask God's blessing on the coffee and the cookies we're going to have downstairs, and we just praise you, Lord, for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen.